Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed on the show are the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, you have a couple of different ways. You can send questions and comments to our Twitter page at Mason Roundtable or on the Facebook event page for episode 226, that's episode 226, History of the Grand Lodge of Ohio, or well, if you're watching live, and I know you are, you can go chat right alongside this YouTube video uh, where you can, if you can't catch it live, you can catch it later. So with that, my name is John Ruark, broadcasting live from the beautiful city of St. Louis, and I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957, in Fairfax, Virginia. Handing it off next to Mike the Intern. Welcome, Mike. Hey, guys. How are you? Uh, Village Lodge, number 274 in Burton, Ohio, and Triandria Lodge, number 780 in uh, Rock Creek, Ohio, where I am the junior steward and lodge education officer. How are you tonight? I am fantastic. Awesome to see you. Next up, Juan Sepulveda. How are you, Juan? I'm doing very well. Good to be with you, brothers. Uh, Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge, number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast. Excellent, excellent. And last but not least, joining us tonight is Jason Richards. Hi, Jason. Hey, John. Uh, Jason Richards here, past master of Acacia Lodge, number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of the Colonial Lodge, number 1821 in Washington, D.C. All righty then. Well... First up on Masonic News this week, we have a doozy, and that doozy includes uh, one edict out of the Grand Lodge of Louisiana, which says, if you can see my screen, there we go, where uh, this week, just uh, not even almost 24 hours ago, the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Louisiana has just issued edict number 2018-02, withdrawing recognition of the Grand Encampment of Knights Templar of the United States. Wow, so something big has to have happened for a sovereign Blue Lodge jurisdiction to remove recognition of an appended body. So what could that thing be? Well, long story short, it, it turns out that a member of the Grand Lodge of Louisiana was expelled last year and yet has been recently found attending the Grand Encampment of Knights Templar of the United States. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the protocol, basically, you know, these appendant bodies, you have to be a Master Mason in order to join them. And if you are expelled from your Blue Lodge, you should be, and it's written in most, most bylaws and laws, you should be expelled from all other appendant bodies um, to which you are a member. Ergo, since this brother has been attending uh, the Knights Templar activities while he has been expelled from his grand jurisdiction, well, that causes some trouble. And so uh, they're basically ignoring the fact that he's been expelled and therefore uh, the Grand Lodge of Louisiana, unfortunately, has to make a tough choice to say, uh, if, you, if you're going to play these games, then we have to withdraw recognition. Um, so... What do you guys think about this? Did they make the right call? Or is this just some sort of um, cat and mouse game that's that's been played? I would say absolutely made the right I would say as long as they've gone the discreet route of dealing with the uh, leaders of the other organizations and attempted to make uh, some sort of amend in the process. And if that effort was futile, then doing an edict like this, I think would be warranted. So I, I hope that's I, I hope that's what happened. But you know, if they don't like the rules as they're written, well, they need to take steps in order to adjust them, and do like what other uh, body did that? Uh, the Shriners, right? Didn't the Shrine? Right, Grand Lodge of Arkansas. Mm -hmm, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And yeah, I think they did the right thing here. My next question with it is, is, you know, what is the uh, grand chapter of Louisiana think too? Because, you know, number one, he was expelled from masonry. Then if he's, if he hasn't been expelled by chapter, well, then that's still, I mean, granted he, they have to, but uh, then he's still allowed in commandery, so to speak, you know, uh, cause if you're not a Royal Arch Mason, you can't even get into commandery. So, you know, how's this play out? You know, so. Right. I mean, and we do know that sometimes this information takes a while to go, uh, uh and flow across, uh, do across the pendant bodies plus due to the time it takes for snail mail to go to different lodges and different pendant bodies. But I mean, come on, this was last year when, when this person was uh, expelled. So you'd think by now this thing called email would help speed things up a bit. Uh, but we don't know all the circumstances. So regardless, um, it, is, it is a tough spot to be in, and uh, hopefully everything gets resolved in, in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. Jason, any, any thoughts on that too? I know you, you chimed in a little bit when Juan started talking. It's uh, it's perfectly within the right of the the grandmaster to do so, and and frankly, I think it's it's further his prerogative to enforce the sovereignty of the Blue Lodge. Masonry starts in the Blue Lodge, and Masonry is a foundation to all of the other appendant bodies. And so, if you if you're kicked out of Masonry, you shouldn't be allowed to re. re Taking your membership because you to be a mason in good standing. So I, th I think he was absolutely justified in doing so. There you go. That's the risk you take. Good, good points. Good conversation. We'll see what happens. Let's let's move into tonight's topic, which is the history of the Grand Lodge of Ohio. So you've heard us do our we're now in our fifth part of the five part series, and rounding things out with Mike the intern giving us the history of his jurisdiction, the Grand Lodge of Ohio. So I'm handing the virtual microphone over to you, Mike. Take it away. So, you know, one of the things as I was doing my research on the Grand Lodge of Ohio that amazed me about all this is during the time that this is, you know, from 1790, actually, if you want to go back to when the first one of these was formed in 1776, but on to it, when Ohio became a state in 1807, um, it's a frontier. You know, the, most of these locales we're talking about weren't major metropolitan cities like, you know, where, you know, uh, some of the other uh, lodges, like even St. John's Lodge was formed. You know, there was already a city there, you know, by then. In these areas, this is, you know, trees and forts, you know, and log cabins. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty impressed by this. You know, it was actually, like I say, the frontier uh, back then. So um, where I'll start is, you know, I'm going to just start heading on. I, I did a lot of research and found some little bits and pieces. And when I did that, I was, like, disappointed. Uh, actually, the other day I picked up a copy of the History of Freemasonry and the Concordant Bodies. And to be honest with you, um, my work is done for me here. This was the best thing I actually, actually, after everything I did, I took a look at this and I'm like, this has everything I was looking for. I mean, literally nice. everything. That's all great. in one package. So, I mean, I apologize to anybody who, you know, if you've read this or if I'm, you know, that I'm just reading out of a book, but honestly, this is it. <laughs> so, uh, Ohio, Jeremy Gridley, Deputy Grandmaster of the St. John's Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. And I'll stop here for just one second. That's a, uh, I have to correct this. It was actually the Provincial Grand Lodge of New England at the time of this, uh, not the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts yet. So anyway, issued a charter February 15th, 1776 to Captain Joel Clark and Lieutenant Jonathan Hart and the other officers of the army for an army lodge to be known as American Union. This was for the benefit of brethren in the Connecticut line of the army. The lodge was duly organized in Roxbury, Massachusetts in the month of March, 1776. During the seven years of the war, this lodge followed the army, holding its meetings at various points uh, where it was encamped and making masons of many prominent and distinguished army officers. At the conclusion of the war, 
the lodge was closed, to stand closed until the masters should call them together. Among the pioneers to the Muskingum River in Northwest Territory were Jonathan Hart, Rufus Putnam, both the master and past master of this lodge. There were likewise a number of brethren who had been members of the military lodge number 10, also warranted by the St. John's Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. Uh, 10 of these brothers assembled in the village of Marietta, Ohio, uh, where the campus, uh, campus, uh, what is it, campus, Marie, um, Martius Lodge was, meaning uh, Camp of Mars, something like that, Fort of Mars. Anyway, Campus Martius. Yeah, that's it. I've got it right here, and I've actually got a picture of it um, to share. So let me get that. Share. And bring that right up. Um, anyway, uh, they, petition, they prepared a petition to Jonathan Hart, the current master of American Union Lodge. Now, granted, the lodge was closed, but he was still the current master until he uh, could call it together. Uh, he resided at Fort Harmon, which is on the opposite side of the river, and they asked for his protection and recognition. Brother Hart, in his reply, expressed a doubt whether a, the warrant in his possession afforded such protection as there are only two who were actually enrolled brothers. But to remove this objection, he stated, there are two brothers who are members and residents in this county, but at too great a distance to attend. There are also two of the petitioners who were constant visitors of this lodge during the war, one of them a past master, Brother Benjamin Tupper, who by custom is a member of all lodges. There are also others of the petitioners who have frequently visited the lodge. So he waived, however, any scruples he might have entertained as to the regularity of the proceedings in the matter and consented to the request of the brethren. And on June 28, 1790, he opened American Union Lodge number one in due form of which he was elected master and Colonel Benjamin Tupper and General Rufus Putnam, the wardens. In the address forwarded to the Grand Lodges at Philadelphia, New York, and the New England states, asking recognition, the hope is expressed, if errors have been committed, that their steps may be guided into the paths they ought to take. On September, in September 1791, a short time previous to the fatal battle of the Miami River known as St. Clair's defeat, the Grand Lodge of New Jersey issued a warrant to Governor Arthur St. Clair and General Josiah Harner to hold a lodge at the village of Cincinnati to be known as Nova Caesarea, number 10, of which Dr. William Burnett was master. The disastrous campaigns with the Indians gave no opportunity to open this lodge, and it was not organized until December 27, 1794. Brother Edward Day, who, may, who was made a mason in Lodge, number 35, Joppa, Maryland, acted as master at its formation. October 19th, 1803, the Grand Lodge of Connecticut granted warrants for the Erie Lodge, number 47, at Warren in Trumbull County. That's actually in my district, which is the 25th district. Um, shoot. Uh, and New England Lodge number 49 at the Worthington, Ohio, to be in force one year after the formation of the Grand Lodge in Ohio. On St. John's Day, June 24th, 1805, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania granted a warrant for the Lodge of Amity number 105 to be held at Zanesville, of which Brother Lewis Cass, who afterward became a distinguished Soldier and statesman was the first master. Permission was given to the lodge to meet either at Zanesville or at Springfield on the opposite side of the river. In consideration of the situation of the lodge in the new country and the difficulties to overcome it by it, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania presented this lodge with a set of jewels which are still in the possession of that lodge. 
On March 18, 1806, the Grand Lodge of Kentucky granted a warrant to Cincinnati Lodge Number 13, of which Brother William Goforth was first master. At the meeting of delegates of the six lodges above named, all in the state at the time, held at Chillicothe, Monday, January 4, 1808, Brother Robert Olivar of American Union Lodge was called to the chair, and George Todd appointed secretary. Uh, for unknown reasons, which it says here, but uh, New England Lodge number 48 were excluded from the convention. There was actually a question of uh, recognition of some of their members that were attending the convention, uh, which, such, uh, which continued its sessions during the four days. It was then resolved that it is expedient to form a Grand Lodge in the state of Ohio. When General Rufus Putnam was elected the first Grand Master, after determining that the first communication of the Grand Lodge should be held at Chillicothe January 2nd, 1809, the convention adjourned. Both Putnam, Grand Master elect, not attending at the time appointed, the Deputy Grand Master, Brother Thomas Henderson, took the chair and opened the lodge in due form and according to the ancient usage. American Union Lodge not being represented and New England Lodge excluded, there were but four lodges represented. It was considered doubtful if four lodges could form a Grand Lodge. A committee was appointed to determine if the Grand Lodge could transact business with representatives of four lodges only. The Grand Lodge agreed to report to do the report of this committee, which was in favor of proceeding. The Constitution of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky was adopted pro tempore for the government of the Grand Lodge. The Deputy Grand Master was installed by the Senior Grand Warden, who then installed the remaining officers elected by the Convention of January 7th, 1808. The Grand Master elect, Brother Putnam, on account of age and infirmity, having declined the office, the annual election being held, the Deputy Brother Samuel Hunting uh, was elected Grand Master and Brother Lewis Cass, Deputy Grand Master. Now, Samuel Hunting, uh, it's an interesting story. His uh, adopted father is known as the first president of the United States. Now, we know that George Washington is actually president of the United States of America, but he was actually the president of the uh, Continental Congress uh during the articles of confederation and that's when they uh that's where they say he was president first but anyway um he was elected grand master and brother lewis cass deputy Grand. the regularity of the formation of the grand lodge of ohio was never questioned by the several grand lodges dermot's amon raisin a reason. The constitution of the ancient was understood to require five lodges to form a grand lodge. It was like many of the laws of masonry at the time, not strictly followed even by the grand lodges, Pennsylvania accepted, who claimed to practice this system of masonry. Uh, American Union Lodge was not represented at the first uh, convention, but refused and refused to become a member of the new grand lodge claiming to have inherent rights of priority of the Grand Lodge. And after considerable controversy, it was declared clandestine and Masonic intercourse prohibited. In 1860, so, so go ahead, sorry. So just a question on that. So um, because of the influence of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, it was, I would assume, ancient ritual at the time? Uh, Ohio was not. It was just that they they were mentioning that that one usually is the one that was declared to say you needed five uh, to because they only had four represented. They had six that wanted to form one, but at their convention, only four were actually represented, mm -hmm. or at the actual convention, not the right. uh, or conclave, because um, the convention had the six, and then at the final convention of it all, there were still only four. Mm -hmm. um, but they decided, no, we had four. We can, when where there were six of us, we know wanted it. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, we can do this. Yeah, and one little fun fact yeah. to, to jump in here too. If you follow where all these Grand Lodges, uh, even Prince Hall Grand Lodges got formed, 
the controversy of how many lodges it takes to meet independently to form a new Grand Lodge mm -hmm. is a matter of debate across all jurisdictions. Uh, it's really funny to see. And, and the, the general consensus mm -hmm. is three or more okay. uh, lodges can meet. But, oh man, um, even there, I know there was a point in time where even the formation of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, first Prince Hall Grand Lodge, was up in question because there were only three. And they said, well, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's been fewer than that that have been formed as, as far as your mainstream lodges that are still operating today. So why are you, why are you busting on us when you guys even followed lesser rules? Oh, yeah. uh, which is a good, which is a good counterpoint. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's interesting too because I, I, I haven't heard new Ohio ritual, but uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if any of those ancient things have carried over since uh, and we know Pennsylvania still does work um, ancient ritual. Yeah, no, there's, it's very different, uh, even than, obviously, than Pennsylvania, because there's a lot that Pennsylvania does does not do that Ohio does. Fair. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, where, you know, a lot of our stuff carries over from Kentucky, even. It's funny because, oh. um, I won't go into the actual specifics, you guys will get it, though. Our aprons, the way we do them, are different, and, you know, uh, than some, you know, for the different degrees. Uh, but there's also our, the way we hold our hand for the, uh, fellow craft degree, um, or, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, is different. And there's some controversy there that it's some of it's from a Northern way and this, but, you know, Kentucky likes to say Ohio does it wrong anyway. So, <laughs> All right, so before, before you get going again, uh, make sure you stop sharing your screen. Oh yes. Yeah. We'll get right back to it. Okay. So um, the chat yeah. is just for us, not not our viewers. Sorry. Our viewers. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, so uh, American Union Lodge was not represented at the convention, but re and refused to become a member of the new Grand Lodge. Also, uh, claiming to have inherent rights of priority over the Grand Lodge. And after considerable controversy, it was declared clandestine uh, and Masonic intercourse was prohibited. In 1816, a petition was received from some of its members praying for a new charter. And a new one was granted by the name of American Union Lodge Number 1, in which reference was made to the former charter and showing that it was a revival of the former lodge. This lodge was represented in Grand Lodge until 1829 when it became dormant, uh, but was revived again in 1842 and has been thriving, active and thriving lodge since. Obviously that's because of the uh, um, anti-Masonic excitement as this book in some aspects puts. Yeah. Now, the lodge Nova Cesarea did not, Cesarea, did not participate in the organization of the Grand Lodge. It surrendered its charter from the Grand Lodge of New Jersey on December 10th, 1805, 20 of its former members applied for a restoration, restoration of the charter, stating that it had been illegally surrendered. Uh, the Grand Lodge of New Jersey found that the surrender was indeed illegal, but inasmuch as a new Grand Lodge had been formed in that jurisdiction, it could not restore the charter and could only commend the petitioners to that Grand Lodge for redress. Application was made in 1812 to the Grand Lodge of Ohio for a charter, which was granted upon condition that all dues should be first paid to the Grand Lodge of New Jersey. Yeah. So that they could actually maintain their, yeah, continuance. Just, cl just clear the books, right? Yep. So the lodge, the lodge is now one of the most active and thriving in the state and is known as Cesarea Harmony Lodge Number 2. All the lodges that participated in the formation of the Grand Lodge, except Cincinnati, are now at work and in prosperous condition. In 1830, there were 94 chartered lodges under and seven under dispensation. Shortly after this date, owing to the anti-Masonic excitement, as I mentioned, the representation of the Grand Lodge began to fall off, which continued notwithstanding for some new lodges were formed until 1837 when the lowest point was reached. There were but 17 lodges represented that year. In the following year, however, there was an improvement which continued and took such to such an extent 
that at the 1842 communication, 35 lodges were represented. From this time forth, the growth of the Grand Lodge of Ohio has been highly satisfactory. The Grand Lodge has no local Masonic dwelling place or meeting at such, just meeting at such different places in the jurisdiction as may have been agreed upon at the previous annual session. That's still the way it is today. We don't actually have a central, I mean, we have an office, but they don't meet there. Um, many of the lodges and other Masonic bodies have halls of their own, some of which are beautiful and well adapted to the wants of the fraternity. The Grand Lodge, Grand Chapter, Grand Council, and Grand Commandery of Ohio early digested plans for raising of funds, preparing plans, and estimates for the formation of a Masonic home in Ohio. Nothing, however, was done in the way of building until the fund in hand amounted to $100,000 and a notable institution was the outcome. Um, and I have some pictures of some stuff and I'll, I want to touch base on just a couple of things that um, are with all of this, but let me find my pictures here and I'll share again. Uh, since I showed you Campus Martius, which was obviously American Union Lodge's uh, first lodge, I'm gonna go to their second lodge, which was a, a Masonic temple in 1872. And let's get to this. Come on, screen share, there we go. Share, switch to the picture. So there's uh, American Union Lodge in 1872. And now for their current one, this is them today. And now at American Union Lodge, they have an apron that some ha some of the claims have been that it was worn once by uh, George Washington, but it's also mentioned that it was um, a gift to George Washington from uh, Lafayette. But I don't know that that's actually it. I've heard that claim has been refuted a few times. And what's odd here, my friend who took this picture I was actually disappointed because he didn't take a picture of this seal that's right down here, which I'll show you. Uh, it is the seal of the American Union Lodge, which now the story goes that American Union Lodge was, um, the name was actually suggested by uh, Ben Franklin. And this uh, seal was designed by uh, Ben Franklin and engraved by Paul Revere. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, because it, because it's up by me, I'm going to show you Old Erie Lodge. I don't have anything for the Cincinnati Lodges. I know they're beautiful down there, but uh, because this one's near me and I've actually visited it, um, I'm a little more impressed at it, with it my, right now. <laughs> this is the Old Erie Lodge uh, as it was originally built in uh, 1907. And I'm going to just kind of zoom in just a little bit here to, oops, not that big. I guess there's no simple way here. But the storefront here is going to, when I show you the newer version, it's very different. But this is, uh, was a busy street corner even back then uh, when they did this. Now, the way it looks today, it's the same building. They still meet there. Um, you can see they actually redid the whole front. The whole uh, fire escape is gone, but even the building that was right here is gone. You know, uh, Warren is—it's a nice little town, but it's—it's uh, it's a depressed area now. But it's their lodge is one of the most beautiful in our district. I mean, there's some I believe down around Kent that are even better. Um, I have been told they are. I haven't been to those yet. Uh, but this is the inside of Old Erie. Mike, do you know if it still has storefronts in the bottom? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is uh, Old Erie. This is actually where we had our uh, uh, one-day conferrals when my dad was raised. 
So this is, uh, that's why I was actually in this. And yes, those balconies get used and everything. So um, that's, I think, about the extent of what I have. Let me just double check my notes here to be sure there wasn't something. Yeah, that's the Washington. Uh, there's actually a nice document out there uh, that lists many of the members of um, American Union Lodge during the Revolutionary War. Um, I didn't didn't really read through that very much because uh, I mean you, when you start looking at that list, it's long. <laughs> you know, we're talking seven years of war, and it's a lot of people. So I bet. You know, and they, you know, with the distinguished members and so forth, you know, officers, you know, it gets, you know, it gets a lot because, I mean, Washington did uh, supposedly meet during one of those lodges, too. So, yeah. Hmm. And it spent a lot of years, apparently, in New York. So. so. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Mike, for. Sure pulling it together. I think it's fascinating. Again, <laughs> I, I'm still just, just fascinated in general how yeah. masonry survived despite being, you know, cobbled together uh, despite across our jurisdictions. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. I we mean, survived, we, <laughs> survived we, despite we survived Indian wars and revolutionary war and, you know, yeah, I mean, and I mean, to me, this, you know, some of this stuff like that, the one in uh, Cincinnati that, you know, they were formed in 91, but they didn't even get to they were chartered rather in 91, but they didn't even get to start meeting until 94 because they were at war with the Miami Indians, you know, mm. yeah. but yeah, most of that area, like I said, is in these areas were just forts. You know, there really wasn't much of a, I mean, they, they said the village of Cincinnati, I mean, not city. <laughs> That's a good point. You know, so yeah. That's that's what impresses me about some of this. It's like, you know, they I mean, don't get me wrong, it's still impressive, you know, for even the cities where they, you know, in you know, in the New England area and so forth where they were doing it, but because yeah, they were still sort of frontier there too. But I'm talking this was, you know, you went out you went out five miles outside the city limits and you were in forest on a trail, not on a road, you know. <laughs> You took your canoe up the river, and you know. Next thing you knew, you're you know, no, you're in Indian territory. You're not even in, you know. There's no city, no trading post. You know. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> and and remind me, what year the Grand Lodge was formed? Uh, eighteen o eight was when they met. Yeah, they met in eighteen o eight. Let me make sure of that. Yeah, they met at the convention was from January 4th to 1808, and they actually had their first communication in on January 7th, 1809. And was that before or after statehood? That was after statehood because I believe 90% certain. I, let me double check that, but I was pretty certain they statehood was 1807. I'm just trying to get my, my timeline straight. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, this site doesn't even have it. Um, let me look here. State of Ohio, real quick. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Any other questions, uh, Juan or Jason? None for me. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Statehood. Let's see if it shows statehood. Oh, come on. I can tell you just about everything else about the state right now, except, oh, 1803. 1803. Well, state. Yeah. Okay. It so. was the 17th, 17th state in uh, 1803. For some reason, I thought it was seven, but that's cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, even that, you know, I mean, that's the one thing as I was doing this, I knew it was the 17th state. And I'm like, you know, that means there was, I mean, four states since the uh, Revolutionary War ended that, you know, were added in, to include our three previous to Ohio, you know, and it's like, this is, this is, we're that close to everything, you know, the beginnings. <laughs> Mike, I, I would, I would ask you mm -hmm. while doing your research and, and 
trying to find little bits and pieces of, of the the Grand Lodge. What really stands out the most? Like without looking at your notes, like what what, mm -hmm. what got you the most excited when you were looking for that information? Honestly, uh, was the information about uh, American Union Lodge being a military lodge first, traveling lodge, you know, and I mean, it, now after reading it today and finding out that they uh, had been clandestine and gone dark and all this kind of disappoints me a little bit about that lodge. But on the other hand, it's considered the oldest lodge in Ohio because of the fact that it was formed in 1776. And even, you know, even with those missing years, it's still, you know, um, they still kind of add up as one of the oldest lodges in Ohio. Yeah. Um, not continuous, obvious, but, you know, yeah. And you shouldn't be disappointed, you know, if you keep in mind at least that it was wilderness, like you mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, anything goes. Let's see how this works. Let's figure this out. Yeah. Of course, there will be those disagreements and those discrepancies that eventually get evened out and ironed out and oh, everything yeah. is kosher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thinking about that, it, it kind of gives me a little bit of hope for for the mess that we find uh freemasonry in oh yeah t today i was thinking about um you know i'm working on a post and you know i think it's going to be a, a an episode and it's titled how big is how big is your masonry mm -hmm. and the premise of it is that people often only know the masonry that they are in and if they see something that differs from that to any degree Mm -hmm. Many people react dismayed. They act a little bit, you know, threatened. Like, how come this is so different? Like, how come you get to wear your apron, you know, inside of your jacket? Yes. You know, it's like, relax. <laughs> <laughs> we're not irregular. We're just in, you know, we're in a hot state. We just keep it unbuttoned and, and we're okay. <laughs> um, but people, react like you know how how dare you practice masonry like that like that's not how masonry works mm -hmm. how i do it is the right way and you know it it makes me think like right now we need to have that awareness that there are so many different um faces of masonry mm -hmm. that for some reason uh, have evolved have spawned and i think and maybe i'm being idealist in thinking this way but there might be a way to somehow unify or somehow bring together and you know once you know for once just masonry is just masonry and there's oh, yeah. there's now so many uh so many facets but who knows it's a, it's a <laughs> long conversation in the future oh yeah but, you know, having these conversations, we can see the origin of our own Grand Lodges sometimes is in question. You know, did it start in this state? Well, it needed a charter from this other state for this long, and it was contested, and it was uh, surrendered, and then asked for back. So, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, because when you look at it, you know, I mean, you were pointing out all the different states that you know came together to actually form yours. You know, yeah. And I mean, there's in mind there's. Massachusetts, there's Pennsylvania, there's New Jersey, there's Kentucky, you know. Wow. I mean, it's like, you know, and I'm sure there's others that we're not, you know, they're not even, you know, aware of in this. I'm sure there's probably some uh, charters that came from Virginia, possibly, you know. Now, I do have a, uh, a question that popped up on the YouTube chat from <laughs> CWH. Uh, who was one of the most interesting Ohio Masons living or in the past or both? Uh, that you familiar yourself with mm. obviously there, mike the intern <laughs> that's, yeah, a dumb that's right there well, you go. Well, number one. <laughs> um you know i don't i did i didn't really do that uh <laughs> familiarize myself with any of the um well no let me rephrase that because we had we had our episode not too long right. ago exactly i was uh, waiting for it so, mike yes Bob Feller, you know, the pitcher from the Cleveland Indians. Mm -hmm. um, now, granted, he wasn't born in Ohio, but uh, he spent his later life in Ohio as an Indian, Cleveland Indian uh, and beyond with that. Um, so, yeah, uh, there was definitely him. Um, 
there's oh james garfield president um actually a couple of those presidents were uh mckinley you know he's an ohio president also but virginia mason so yes this is true yeah we can claim him <laughs> i think you could even i um uh, no Gar garfield was here taft was done in dc but he was an ohio president mm -hmm. yeah so yeah and uh jason hacker on the um youtube chat says Put putnam no oh, yeah rufus putnam he was the general that uh, but he's also the guy that uh was the officially the first grandmaster elect but he uh due to his age and infirmity he refused the position uh, at the communication so they had to uh move the uh deputy grandmaster up and so forth move the line so he was the first grandmaster elect yep yeah um i just wanted to to mention real quick i found a, a list here and i know you may you mentioned james garfield mm -hmm. and i have william mckinley yep william taft yeah and warren harden yes warren harding too yeah. yeah wow yeah yeah four of our seven presidents yeah, yeah. at very, least very cool. initiated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting yeah. <laughs> all right barring anything else i think it's about time for us to wrap up and do final thoughts and shameless plugs and so i will start with juan sepulveda for his final thoughts all right well I've, I've asked the question several times in in various places about what people think about this this series and of course we've from from behind the curtain we might be a little bit hesitant it's like you know will people really like this would be interested and usually the feedback that i receive is positive and one common response i receive is like i wish we could do all of them now, granted, we can't do 50 in a row. That will be 2019, <laughs> pretty much on, on its entirety. Um, but we could sprinkle a few here and there and, mm -hmm. and keep the series alive because I find it very interesting. And I think it's, um, um, you know, how my focus is applied Freemasonry. What I am interested in the most is how to take the the tenets of Masonry, the different virtues it's it stolen in, in the fraternity and how to put those to work in our lives. So I've never been really deep into the history component of it. I follow suit and I, you know, do my research whenever we have some assignments to to do it. But it's never been my it's never been, you know, what what pushes me the most. But this series has gotten me excited. When we started talking about Siri, I'm not talking to you. I said series. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this collection of, of of episodes from even when we started on our respective lodges, I find it very interesting to to get you know look back at the story of our town, the story of our lodge, the community, and I think it's something that injects some sort of pride into. Um, what we do and where we are in, in masonry so hopefully some of the brothers that are listening to this get excited about it too and they do their own little research and you know if you find some really exciting things about your grand lodge let us know and we might bump yours to the top of the list and you know and, and feature that that grand lodge first but uh, thank you again for for listening and for watching and participating I invite you to go to freemasonryart.com. I have some uh, new art prints uh, available. And I'm going to start little by little releasing some of the originals. I haven't listed hardly any of my original drawings there before. And I've had some brothers asking about them. So go to freemasonryart.com. There's only one of each. So it's first come, first serve. All right. Thank you right. for watching. Thank you, Juan. Okay. Uh, let's see. Go to you, Mike. Any other mm. last things you want to add? Or yeah, any insights uh, you have? Well, you know, um, I enjoyed doing this. I really did. I enjoyed looking up Ohio's history on this. And uh, actually, I want it's got me the idea that I want to dig a lot deeper, you know, a lot deeper into, you know, American Union Lodge's history. Um, 
and actually Old Erie, which is up here uh, by me. I want to dig into their history a little bit and find out more about uh, their charter and so forth, where they got it and you know how they got it and so forth. Um, and the other thing is, uh, you know, um, Juan was talking about doing some more of these series. I can think of a uh, few states that should be fairly easy for us to get together some people, Minnesota, um, mm -hmm. Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi, mm -hmm. Louisiana. You know, okay. I, I think we know some people who could fulfill those roles. Um, you know, <laughs> and, you know, if I reached out to the podcasting community, I'm sure I could come up with a guy for North Carolina and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. so, you know, maybe Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, you know, those would be some good, you know, just, just you know, making some suggestions. Anybody out there want to reach back and say, hey, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. All right. Thanks again for your research, Mike. Uh, yeah. it, was, uh, it was great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, Jason, final thoughts. All right. So, Really great episode, Mike. Thanks so much for all the research you did. It was just uh, it's absolutely awesome, and uh, loved loved hearing about Ohio Masonic history. Gutubs are originally from um, the Ohio River Valley area, and so um, you know, just hearing uh, you know where where some of uh, their lodges came from, especially my Amity Lodge, which is. Uh, one of the other big lodges in in Zanesville, where my where my folks are from, uh, is just uh, was a really fun episode for me. That had a lot of a lot of meaning for me, just based on my my family Masonic history. So thanks so much for for doing all that research. It was a really fun show. Uh, thanks so much to everybody watching. Uh, it's great to uh, great to interact with with you all. Uh, so we've got some good episodes lined up so come back next week it'll be fun uh stay tuned to um jack aquilina's brought to light podcast because i got to play Nicholas lane from castle island last night and he does a little bit of recording for for jack and dave and we did an interview last night so uh check that out uh, see it from brought to light here in the next couple weeks very cool awesome sorry i missed it <laughs> sorry i missed the chance to hang out with nicholas lane of course from uh, castle island virtual lodge so I, I hope you gave him a warm virginia welcome i did i loaded him up with swag nice good thank you uh let's see uh over to me uh this is fascinating again i always enjoy hearing more especially where you know people migrated across what we know as as state lines, but how the Grand Lodge of Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, holy smoke, they were busy chartering lodges all over the place. Uh, so they had a lot, they had a lot of influence back in the day, especially. Um, so it's it's a wonder that really a more ancient ritual didn't stick uh, compared to because they were they were very busy side of. Uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, I wanted to, before I forget, thank uh, brothers Chris and Jake uh, while out here in St. Louis, who uh, took me on a nice tour of the Scottish Rite Temple. And um, I made sure that uh, I snuck in a copy of It's Business Time, Adapting a Corporate Path for Freemason to Valley of St. Louis. Lewis's Scottish Rite Library, so that way um, they have a copy of that for future generations. Uh, they're currently in the process of remodeling and moving the library, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that uh, we left a little bit behind as I, I got the tour. Um, so thanks to the Brothers of St. Louis. Thank you for Mike for all his great research, and thank you, the listener, for checking us out. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much for watching and keep searching for more light. Have a good night.